I go through phases where I've lost more money than I should have. I've lost money in other things because of my emotional attachment to losing in poker initially. But I think over time it taught me to be more risk averse, like to be more mentally stable through times of adversity. Poker is a combination of different skill sets. From understanding the underlying principles, from statistical, like you would know, like statistics is an important part. It's about tilt control, uh, mindset control, even perspectives. Lowering ego, managing bankroll. It's about picking up meta game dynamics in terms of like how you should adjust to certain games. A lot of different factors which I like, blends into one to make like a very good poker player. That's, instead of being sad about losing or busting a tournament, you tend to be aware how fortunate you are to be able to play high stakes poker, which to no person is a lot of money to, to buy in at a location like for example Cyprus or the Bahamas or whatever where if I'm not playing poker I'm, I might not even ever be there things like that and by being grateful of a lot of these things in life it makes um, you happier when you do your job so when you go through for example like down swings or experiencing losses it's easier to get back on track and play again or improve instead of being soaking like why am I so unlucky because you're already very lucky to be playing in the first place ปุณนัทปุณสี Thailand's number one poker player today a m a w e r get to sit down and talk about his journey to winning more than 15 million dollars we talk about the rise from Bangkok to the global stage of the poker world and we get to talk about the country the opportunity of Thailand when it comes to legalize poker welcome to a m a w e r yep, thanks for having me first of all congratulations on your latest winning at the Triton I know you have been winning a lot of Tournaments, but still, this one is one of the most impressive one. Yep, I mean, running very good, obviously, <laughs> these past two years. But yeah, that one was quite um, really happy to win that one. Mm -hmm. But first of all, uh, for the international audience, your name is Punat. What does it mean in Thai? Okay, so this is from what I I know, right? So I think it has the same meaning to the name of one of the Buddhist gods, which probably means you will be successful if you try to do something. Yeah, so like if, if you attempt to achieve something, then you generally uh, be successful. That's kind of what my name means. I think that's what my parents told me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How would you introduce yourself, though? It, okay, so initially, um, I was a poker enthusiast. Um, although I played poker for many many years, because like I had other interests outside of poker in terms of um, personal investments, or I I studied geography and, and environmental science, so I did uh, something related to my field of study. Uh, and stuff. So, but I guess nowadays, ever since I I took poker tournaments more seriously two and a half years ago, now maybe you could classify me as a part time, in okay, as a an investor slash professional poker player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that partly stems from the fact that I'm I'm competing very regularly these days, and and obviously the money that comes with it. There's obviously some financial benefits from it, especially if you run good like me. But there's also other endeavors I try to chase. I try to chase or. Other goals I have within poker, which requires me to to be playing this kind of full time for this past two years and maybe for like the next year or two. So you were born in Thailand, and you got a chance to went abroad and study in the UK. So I was born in Bangkok, Thailand. I studied in an international school since I was uh, three or four years old. And when I graduated, when I was 18, I moved to the UK to. Study in uh, the west of England um, in a small city called Bristol uh, at the University of Bristol. I did geography there, as I mentioned, and I did a, a four-year program there, which gave me a master's. And I did another one in UCL in London in a more specialized kind of topic. So I did um, environment and sustainable development. And yeah, uh, actually, initially when I came back to Thailand, I did stuff related to this. Uh, when I was in the UK, I was playing quite a lot of poker actually <laughs> throughout uh, my studies. But when I came back, obviously poker is not um, accessible here, and I still was um, watching a lot of the stuff that was being broadcasted on a lot of the media channels related to poker. But when I was back in Thailand for like the two-year period, I I didn't play. I think. Um, a hand of poker for for like one or two years. Ago. I assume you wouldn't plan like fifteen or ten years ago. You wouldn't plan your life to be, you know, like who you are today. I mean, I assume that you may have some confusion whether you how much of a time and resource you would allocate it for poker or other career or family business. Can can you tell me more about that? How how did you end up, you know, like playing poker full time as you are now? <laughs> Okay, so um, I always um, enjoyed playing card games that requires an element of skill. Since I was young, whether that's playing with some of my friends for no money or with my 
family or my dad in particular, who taught me different variants of card games that, that are not pure, pure forms of gambling, basically. So games that obviously requires luck, but you can use skills to, to win games. And when I was like 15, 16, I think I was really confused. And my family never forced me to follow a certain career path. They always gave me options and good advice. And back then, I remember choosing geography because I thought it was the only subject I read during my free time when I was like a bit of a teenager slash um, um, approaching adulthood. And so I thought at that point, there wasn't many Thai people learning like doctorates in, in like, in, like environmental politics or like global warming issues or, or stuff like that. So I thought maybe I could <laughs> be a pioneer <laughs> in this kind of field. Obviously, when I went to study, there was a big gap between um, high school and university in terms of the academic level that you need to understand these things. And I think over time, I realized I still enjoy the topic, but maybe my impact uh, might not be so big, um, especially in, in Thailand where things are, are controlled differently and stuff. And But I still, I, I, I still quite passionate about a, a lot of the things I studied uh, based on the topic, but I kind of realized, um, I think, uh, after I graduated, that maybe I I'm, I should look for another also career path where I could still uh, get involved in a lot of these community projects or like attempts to alleviate some um, of the the problems in society this and that. But besides that, then having another career path is obviously good in terms of like okay gaining like income or doing things that you kind of like have a passion for and. And poker slowly have became a bigger and bigger part of my life since I went to study in the UK. So when I did geography in, in university, there was not only no Thai students in the course, there was no Asians. I was the only Asian in the course. And when I was 18, I was quite introverted. And me going abroad for the first time without any friends, I, I felt um, a bit different to other people. So, so in Bristol, there was a local casino, um, formerly known as Scarlet Casino. Now we ran it as Brainball. So I went there quite a lot during the first year and played poker because I always watch poker as part of movies on, on, on TV and, and watch like the World Series broadcasting and that with my parents and stuff and obviously like a lot of the beginners the first year I've lost but I've always separated a certain amount of money for that so I used to play very low stakes in Bristol but I would um, segregate monthly allowances for that into, into like, attempting to have tried to build a bankroll for poker obviously failed initially but I slowly realized the same people were winning and trying to see what they did well and stuff and, and yeah slowly over time I started to win in games I, I was playing in so I might not be poker is all relative right so if you're playing in games where you're better than others you don't have to be the best in the world you just need to be better than your comp competition right so you playing in a game where everyone else is kind of like not as good as you but you're just like an for example uh, an above average player you have a lot more win rate than if you're like the best player in the world, but you're playing against all the elite. Mm -hmm. So poker is a lot about game selection and stuff. But like um, back then, I was making, um, I guess, decent income from poker whilst I was studying at the same time through these cash games. And I never actually even played tournaments really in, in the UK, apart from the odd one for fun. So I think, I guess, like it's become quite habitual or become one of my main hobby slash um, part-time activity that could gain income in the university. I don't know how to classify it because it's still not a job, right? My job there was to study. And after getting my degrees, I came back to Thailand and tried to focus on other kind of like aspirations. But yeah, poker is always still a lot of time on my mind because it's something I grew up with since I was like a teenager. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have mentioned that you suffered a loss in the first year, right? Yeah. Can, can you tell me more about the you know poker and the uh, income and the expense journey. What was the first when was the first year that you you see that this is could be you know like a full time things? I I guess like um in my initial years of playing poker, let's say that's like the the duration of my first four years in Bristol. Um, that's when I was still playing like stakes like ten, five ten or below. I started playing even like twenty five p fifty p in my. I, that game doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> but um, so so yeah. So the first year I I lost, but I I wasn't playing so big. I wasn't buying so deep, but I was um, losing over time. But I wasn't massively losing in the sense that I felt I had no chance of winning this game. I felt I did something correctly, but there was also a lot of things that I misunderstood about the game or things I could improve. And if you ask me when did I started to become a winner, probably somewhere towards the end of my second year at the university. I guess like poker is a bit of networking, right? So if you start to become friends with some winning players or start to share some strategies, you get to see the game in a different way. You get to be enlightened about new theories or 
um, concepts that you might not be aware of. And I think like by the third and fourth year, I was beating the stakes. I was playing so like one, two pounds, two, five pounds, things like that. But still, I still never thought of like making it my primary source of income. I was just thinking if it's a hobby that I enjoy doing, it's quite brain stimulating. And if I get to improve myself every day, I think poker is a good way of like you reflecting on your progress. It's similar to if you go to the gym or playing a certain sport, right? You can see your progress every day. Poker is also the same. Like you could go and have a losing session, but you felt you understand new concepts today or you played better than the last time but you got unlucky, that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. And I towards like my fourth year and, and when I moved to London for my master's, I tend to measure my improvement based on how much I think I know about the game or how I'm improving there, but they're more than my results. So I don't attach my like progress on like monetary kind of success. So obviously winning is good, but like I don't think, oh, I'm losing like five sessions in a row now. I want to quit. Not, not like that. I, I try to see if I make any mistakes in these sessions and that. And so yeah, like I said, it became a, a fun part-time activity that I have a lot of passion for, that I invest a lot of time in and, and make some money on the side whilst I was a student. So that's was kind of nice, yeah. Poker has become more popular in Thailand. And now many people think that, okay, maybe I should do this full time because when they see the news, you fall like millions, you know, like everyone is winning monies. Mm, what, what would be your advice to the people who start enjoying this hobby activity and what are proper, you know, like allocation, whether some people should play 100% full time, some people should do this as a hobby? Okay, so first of all, I think we need to make it clear that a lot of these news, they glorified. So they normally mention winnings when you're winning, which are obviously facts, but they don't really mention on down swings and even like um, a lot of the statistics they don't show actual net winnings because a lot of people might be like you as a person who are enthusiastic about poker would realize that you could go through 10 20 binds without catching a tournament right so um people who don't fully understand tournament poker would perceive that we are making more money than we actually are way more i think that's the first thing do the winning players uh, make money in in tournament poker yes they do some of them a lot However, it's something that comes in ebbs and flows in the way like you, you go on streaks of winning a lot and then you go through a bit of a announcing usually and it fluctuates a lot, right? But in the long term, the better players will always be generally winning. That's why it's considered for me a sport more like, and, and not gambling because you can always improve and the, like you see, uh, the best players, they stood the set of time so they win over decades and stuff. So there's got to be a reason for that, right? So my advice to like newcomers, um, I think firstly, if you come to poker, you need to come, you need to play because you really enjoy it. You, you need to play for the right reason. So not because initially you like the game and you instantly think you'll make a lot of money from it. I don't think that's the right way to approach it. You probably should play poker because you enjoy the strategical aspect of it. You probably should play poker because you enjoy the social element of it. You enjoy playing poker because you think it's a way of you having a kind of baseline to see if you're improving every day on a specific kind of like thing. And I think for those players who are new to poker, they need to uh, play it for a certain duration of time where they're proven to win during quite a long time. And that's not a few months, that could be a year or two years uh, for that playing level or the playing field or, or for the buying level before actually even consider doing it full time. I think poker is a, is a great sport especially tournaments to do as a part-time hobby or as an, a leisure activity. And it could be a, a hobby that has that is taken seriously. For example, for me in the early years, it took me many, many years to, to do it um, full-time, you know. So I think my advice is like, um, you shouldn't sacrifice anything just to make poker a full-time job unless you're proving it a long time. So like never like sacrifice education, never sacrifice your job or always you should try and seek um, means of gaining passive income through other methods besides of relying just on poker, right? Because otherwise it could be very stressful, it's very uncertain, I think. But having poker as a side hustle, if you will, whilst doing other things, I think could be good for or beneficial to a lot of people who enjoy the game. That's my advice, yeah. You have mentioned poker as sports, and I agree with you, it's, it's, uh, it's way more sports than gambling. I want to hear from you. If you think about sports, there are discipline, there are, also, of course, talent. There are also, you know, like training and constantly improving yourself. Imagine football player when, when they, they, they're getting better at their trades. They, are, they get paid more. They get moved to a bigger clubs. Can, can you tell me more about how, how poker improved you? Maybe in the last 10 years that you were a beginner and now you are the pro. Okay, so 
I'm pretty sure in more so in poker, a lot of people make mistakes throughout the journey, myself included. I I go through phases where I've lost more money than I should have. I've lost money in other things because of my emotional attachment to losing in poker initially. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gone through some um, bad time management, bad bankroll management at times, but I think over time it taught me to be more risk averse, like to be more mentally stable through times of adversity. It taught me how to manage my bankroll better, I think, over the years. I think it took many, many years, but eventually we finally got there, I guess. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, taught me to not become complacent. I'm not, I'm not sure with business, but I don't think the most successful business people do anyway, but in poker, the, the top, top players, they're never complacent with their ability. Mm -hmm. So in poker, you could go through heaters where you win a lot. And that might not even be due to your skill level. That could just be like, you're doing some, something right, but a lot of it is luck, right? Mm. So one of the biggest things that it taught me, maybe I have the right friends who tend to always guide me in the right way that I, I never thought like I was good enough to stop learning pretty much. I always seek to try and improve myself. And even in events that I've won initially, I go through and I realize I made a lot of mistakes, which end up working out. So I try to not even know which, what the mistakes are, but understand it, why theoretically it is a mistake and maybe find situations that are similar to that to, to learn new things, you know, as like a kind of like case study pretty much in, in a lot of these things. And yeah, so I think like whether you win or you lose, it's a very good way of, it's a very good skill set to have to, to always uh, try and seek flaws in the game rather than being like um, satisfied with your current ability. I think that's what it taught me. And I guess a lot of these things like patience involved, um, emotional control, it relates to everyday life, right? If you are better that, at uh, controlling your emotions and, and like strive to become better every day, then you're going to be successful in other areas in life, I guess. Mm. Are there anything that you learn on the poker table that can apply to your life or maybe business? I think uh, one of the biggest traits, especially in, in live poker, is you need to be always aware of the surroundings, what the other players' mood or tendencies are. So I think um, noticing all these different little things and analyzing it in a short period of time is is a good skill set to have in business, right? So you need to be aware of all the external factors that are occurring at once and having, and the faster you are at analyzing those factors to see the best solution going forward, um, it's, it's going to be an edge compared to the com competitiveness of the, the field, right? So, so I think this is one of the things at the poker table. I guess um, in, in poker, when you're at the table, you go through phases of like, your stack goes up and down, up and down all the time, right? And you shouldn't, like I said before, have a, an attachment to the the amount of chips you have in front of you, pretty much. It's more like situational and how you're going to navigate to the next step, next step. For example, in business, you make investments, some some work out, some, some don't work out. It's about like your, your new present situation now, how you're going to move forward, this and that. So I think that's kind of similar in a way. Like some people, they, they become very happy when they have a lot of chips, but then when they have little chips, they become to, they start to panic and stuff. And I think in business, you shouldn't panic. Similar to in poker, you should always seek to try and see how you could make the situation better, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what are some critical lessons that you have learned? I assume that your, your progress as a poker player, there, there must be a lesson that, that you get to learn and then your results exponentially grow. You know, what, what are those lessons that like, oh, wow, I wish I knew this 10 years ago that, that would um, make me I, much better. Okay, so I, I think um, the winning exponentially stuff is, is you need to acknowledge like, okay, I would like to think I keep improving, mm -hmm. but you need to acknowledge like to win tournaments, a lot of it acknowledges to a large element of luck. Um, many, many hands or flips, like the winner, like luck dictates who wins certain parts, who cash certain events, who, who, who makes certain final tables and stuff. Okay, that, that, there's a lot of concepts in poker which I've been not discovered for myself, but maybe like through playing, I come, I encounter new situations and I consult with the right people and they give me kind of explanation on the general strategy and I go, oh wow, like, I wish I knew this long time ago. Yeah, there, 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 there are many of those. Like, and that could come from post-flop play, pre-flop play, ICM stuff, because I never really played tournaments for until like probably three years ago. So a lot of these are still new for me, you know? although having like a background in poker for many years, tournament poker is still something relatively new for me. So that's why I'm still enjoying it quite a lot. Like I feel like, yeah, even though my results were quite good recently, like I still have a lot to learn, I think. Mm. I'm reading this on the internet, it said that in poker, Confidence is essential. So you want to feel like you are, you are in control. But then again, I think a lot of people 
and I, I feel like this could also apply to life and business as well. To a certain point, they're gonna they're gonna get bad beats, and then they get they become tilt or losing the confidence. How how did you navigate yourself? Okay, so I agree that confidence is a very important trait when you play poker. It gives you like an ability to make plays that if you're like kind of scared or worried, then maybe you don't get to take risks in what you're supposed to take. Because poker sometimes it's not about winning. Or losing poker is about making the right decisions, and sometimes the right decision would feel risky to the average person. Um, but theoretically, it's it's correct, or against a certain type of opponent, it would be correct. So it's good to have confidence, but confidence and arrogance there's a very fine line between the two. And sometimes being overly arrogant is not good. Similar to how you do business, right? If you're like uh, overly arrogant and take too much risk in a certain um, position, maybe it's uh, not the best way to allocate your assets. For example, like poker also, like, um, you might be winning a lot of pots, but sometimes it's not about winning every pot, you know? Sometimes it's more about like controlled aggression, like playing correctly. And playing correctly doesn't mean being overly aggressive. It sometimes means taking the passive route or allowing your opponents, to, inducing your opponents to maybe make mistakes, something like that. So you touch about tilt. Um, I want confidence to be based not on winning chips at that particular moment in time. Of course, if you win more pots, um, you automatically feel better. That's um, normal to most humans, but I want you to take confidence as in you're confident that you're making the right play. So you might be able to induce your opponent to go all in with two tens when you have two jacks, but they hit a ten. You shouldn't lose confidence because you played correctly. You understood that you had the best hand. You um, induce him to put or allow him to put all his money in with the worst hand and if he sucks out then there's nothing you can do, right? Mm. Um, the only way I think you should lose confidence is maybe you underestimate an opponent at the table or you made a, a bad call in a situation where you knew you wanted to fall but deep down your emotions didn't allow you to fall. This is when I think uh, it's more reason to lose confidence more than taking a bad beat in my opinion. But then after you lose confidence in that manner, if you're still in the tournament, you should regain composure as soon as possible. Maybe take things more slower. But yeah, it's about recouping um, your senses back because as long as you're still in the tournament, you still always have a chance. Yeah. Mm. So in your journey, there, there are times when you are actually losing, mm -hmm. but you actually feel esteem. Mm. You actually feel confident because you, you feel like you have made the correct decision. But there are things that you cannot control. Yeah. At the same time, you might be winning, but you uh, you might lose that confidence because like you are you know that you are not playing to your best. I mean that on top of my head, that do you want me to give examples? Like, yeah, so, yeah, go on, ahead. on top of my head, head I, I think these were probably the two events you watched as well. So in the first hundred K main Triton, which I've, I've won in two thousand twenty two, um, it was the biggest stage for me at the point. There was a lot at stake. Uh, I never played a hundred K before. It was on like I think the stone bubble or two to the money and it had like a middle to a, a like a middling of the pack at the moment and was this what was this who I consider was the best in the world, Steven Chidwick. I got it all in with aces and tens. Obviously it's a cooler, but he, he beat me and I became the shortest stat and I felt a lot of pressure at that point because like the time all time money list was at stake. My first hundred K cash like was at stake and it was the biggest tournament I ever played. I also had a very bad series. I had a big loss in the cash game that was televised. I I did um, multiple bullets in the other tournaments, mm -hmm. which meant like if I didn't catch this event, I would be losing quite a lot for my first super high roller series. And but I I still tried to to persevere through that moment, and I made some plays which I thought was good. I made quite a risky jam, but that wasn't because of tilt. That was because I was understanding how people were perceiving me, and I think I would get more folds because they don't expect me to jam light in my first hundred k stuff like this. So that was a uh, one of the biggest tests, I think, of my career because I realized I'm at a disadvantageous position now with having the shorter set. Everyone's always, everyone is just more experienced than me at that, um, the final two tables. So I had to pick my spots though, and, and luckily I, I got some shots through and picked up some hands to get some reshots through to build my stack up into like a, a not, the, not being the shortest again, and someone busted, and yeah, I, I made the money of that tournament. So that was like my first time ever feeling a lot of pressure. Um, after taking a bad beat, but obviously I didn't lose confidence because I didn't do anything wrong. I was more like not confident, not based on my play, but because of my situation, but I tried to maintain composure in the moment and, and, and get through that 
adversity phase, which, which I was quite proud of, I think, at that point. Another example was Heads Up in Taipei. I think you were there when, when I won the APT main. Um, so I had a really good run um, since day three. I always had the ship lead, I think, final 50 players. And I had an overwhelming lead going to Heads Up. I think I had like almost a 10 to 1 advantage. And with that stack uh, distribution, um, it was expected for me to continue my run good and, and maybe win in not so long of a time, right? But then things didn't go our way. We lost like four or five all-ins and suddenly I lost a big pot where I actually made a mistake, I think, my hand on two streets and he gained a ship lead. And that was the point where I was quite tilted, but more so like, not based on luck, but like, I think I chose a strategy that was uh, too aggressive for my situation versus uh, my particular opponent. And also I felt I was playing quite a long day of poker where I wasn't fully focused at certain points. I kind of wanted it to be finished quite fast because everyone was watching, but then a break came in time and my friends came to give me support and also give me advice on how I should approach because although he has the lead, it's still very relatively deep for heads up uh, in a tournament, which he felt I should take a lower variance route in a lot of spots. And I was able to maintain my composure and then change my strategy a little bit in mid-game, which I normally don't do. I normally play the same way until I finish an event and then come and uh, analyze afterwards. But I think that was the first time I actually totally changed the way I was approaching the match, um, when he actually had the lead. And luckily, a lot of my reads were right, and I was able to um, get lucky enough to, to, to win that tournament. But yeah. Mm. So sometimes you need to also admit to yourself that you are doing it wrong. Just because that poker is... Um, not a black and white area, uh, game, right? So it's no 100% correct, 100% wrong because in solvers, they solve strategy to equilibrium where they also assume you, your opponent is also playing at, at equilibrium. So this play is good against a robot, for example. But when you're playing against certain types of opponents, of course the fundamentals exist, right? It's a, it's a non-exploitable strategy, but there could be strategies that are better suited to playing your opponent. Mm -hmm. And considering the tendencies of my opponent, heads up, um, props to him, I thought he played really well. I thought I did some things which were probably not the highest EV against uh, him. But maybe because I was playing such a long day, I didn't uh, notice it uh, at the start of the, the heads up match. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I felt um, wrong in this case, felt like I, was, I should be aware that there are better ways to play certain hands against, against him, but I wasn't aware until the break came and I was already stuck in chip. So. Luckily, I didn't get um, too many bad beats, so I, I came out on top, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking of the famous hands, the latest one was against Phil Ivy, mm -hmm. And a lot of people talk about that hands. I think you know which one. The yeah, 10 dream yeah. Yes, yes. But can you talk me through to that hand? Uh, my way of thinking? Yes. So Phil Ivy is a legend of the game. He's a very good player. and. I thought my hand class pre-flop um, versus him who might think I'm going to be raising out of position that uh, a bit tighter because I have to play the rest of the hand out, out of position against someone like him. I decided to raise my hand. I thought it was a hand class that uh, could raise. Um, maybe it's a bit too loose, but I decided to raise. So he folds hands like, I don't know, like queen deuce off suit, jack five off suit, stuff like this, you know. And if he calls, we still have slight playability. Um, but when he calls, his range here is going to be re relatively strong mm -hmm. um, because, but not, not the strongest because the strongest he would 3-bet and then get in and, and some of his like bad hand but have a big card for example, king 4, ace 2 might decide to 3-bet. So his hand is going to be hand that has quite a lot of playability on the flop. So when it comes ace, queen 10, I think, rainbow, when I have bottom pair, even if I have top pair, I would check. I think it's a range check here because I think his range is condensed towards that ace, queen 10 region, you know, and as he did, he had king jack offset. I was going to fold if he bet quite big because my hand can't withstand a lot of pressure on late, later streets. But he decided to bet like a quarter pot, which is obviously understandable because he had a very strong hand. He had a nuts pretty much. So I decided to call to try and improve and I turn a flush draw. And here is it's like quite an interesting spot because when the turn goes check, check, normally you think your opponent cannot have a straight, right? Because they would always bet a straight on the turn. But Phil Ivey is a very good player and his hand is a very good checking hand. One, he has the king of hearts. So it protects himself from, it kind of prevents me from having many flush draws, for example. And him having the jack as well is kind of not great because when he bets the turn, he wants me to call with a set of two pairs, right? Having a jack kind of blocks that in quite a large way. So by him checking back, it's 
to get value on the river, to make me bluff some of my hands. So if I have 10-5 instead of 10-3, I might bluff the river mm -hmm. to make him fold an ace, something like that. Mm -hmm. And to make him uncapped, because there's going to be times where turn's going to go check, check, and he wants to value bet two pairs, for example. So he has to check sometimes with the straight things. So on the river, when I make a flush, I knew against a lot of opponents I would bet, because I don't think they could have a straight, but against IB, I think he could have a straight. And when he bets, I think it's very likely he's going to have a straight. Now on the river, I obviously was check raising. I thought my hand was going to be the best possible hand. Because uh, maybe it's a bit analytical, but I don't think he can have the ace high flush or the king high flush. The reason being, if he's got a king high flush draw on the turn with a straight, I think he would always bet because he wants to free roll a king. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? So if he's got a king and a flush draw, he wants to put money in when he still has a free roll. Mm -hmm. If he's got not flush draw, it's either got to be ace, king, or hearts, which he can't have because he didn't, didn't three bet pre flop. Ace and a heart, which he can't have because he have the ten of hearts. And I don't think he bets a bad ace on the flop. So if he's got ace seven, ace six, ace five suited, I think he would just check. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't think he's got a flush. My hand, I should just go all in, but in that spot, for different reasons of playing with him and how he understood me, I thought my size would get caught more. It, it's probably wrong in theory. I think it is actually. I checked it afterwards, but I thought this size was, was likely to more likely to get caught. And obviously, coming from someone who looked up to him, watched him since I was like 15, 16, I never thought I would be in a situation to put him in the tank for like, I don't know, 15 minutes, was it? it? Was 17 minutes, I think. You watched the thing, right? Yes. Minutes. And I wanted to fade the two minute and then he goes all in, in case my read was wrong. But after that, I was quite comfortable. But I remember just staring at the same spot at the clock and just see him from the side of my eye keep throwing more and more time banks. I was obviously hoping for a call at that point. And I think he burned through most of his time banks and called. And yeah, that was like a key hand to make me win that tournament. It was a very good hand Thank for, you. For, for <laughs> beginners to learn as well. Huh? Very, very lucky, obviously. Like against him, my hand on the floor is very few percent to win, you know. But. It was another famous hand, a lot more straightforward. Uh, I think it's one of the hands that people get to see you on, on social media was against Dan Cates, where you run your SS against his eight. Yeah, so that was very straightforward. That was the biggest cash game I played at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it was at Triton, my first ever Triton. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I think I had a bad start and, and then like I recovered and now I was in a bit of profit and me and gentleman played this three bet part where I re-raised pre-flop and I turned aces four and I checked the turn because I want to balance my range. But if I have, so when I, Squeeze from the small blind, my hand's gonna be like big aces, but also hands like tens, jacks, queens, kings, and a lot of these hands when the ace comes on the check, and the jungle man actually retains a lot of his ace x in range. So um, it kind of forced him to bluff some pocket pass, some like backdoor flush draw flows, and there was a flush draw on the turn as well, which um, I'm safe, right? Because I already have a full house. So I remember a check, he bears a core, he could just have an eight, you know, like trip eight, he doesn't need to have course. And when the river comes to flush, I remember I was like, really happy because now he's have more value hands that he can go all in for value because he thinks I might have pocket kings or maybe even a hand like ace king, ace queen that I likely gonna fold, right? Mm. So, so when he goes all in, I called pretty quickly because I didn't want to slow roll him because I'm never folding my hand anyways, right? It's like, basically I call up expecting to win the pot a lot of the time. And so when he showed his hand, I was shocked. I remember like saying a little wow on TV, but yeah, more like, not angry, but chalk, you know, because I never play a game that big and I never experienced a cooler that, that bad as well. Like, I played 10 years, I never had that in a dream before. So yeah, that was quite, quite, quite shocking. <laughs> it was also one of your biggest cash games? It was the biggest cash game I played. It was 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 with 2,000 anti. I don't think I played a game that, yeah, that, that's got to be the biggest game. But I you played. took it very well. I mean, <laughs> for, for, for most people would be like, of course, like, there are sportmanships. But there are also disappointment that could be prote, but you didn't you didn't prote any of that. I mean, I obviously was disappointed, but there's nothing I can do, right? I mean, I played the hand in the right way. It was a cooler. I mean, before I play the game, I have to be prepared that if I there's chances I would lose. Like there's obviously many chances that I could lose. So I was already mentally prepared for it, but I didn't do it. I was losing this way. I thought if I lose, it's going to be something a closer spot or a difficult spot. This was more like a a straightforward spot, which was very unlucky for me, more, more so than that. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I, I was more like a bit surprised of, of, of the situation. And that's why like, I, I was, <laughs> it's a very funny journey because after that hand, I actually played that main event, which I, which I won.
Mm. But if I lost that, I would have had a very bad series. Yeah, but I, I still didn't think I, I would have been like totally regretful of when to, going to Brighton for the first time. I think it gave me a lot of good experiences, meeting a lot of cool people, and and yeah, I, I felt like it, it was like uh, an eye opener for me into into the world of high stakes poker. If that mm. makes sense. How did you digest and process it after that, though? I mean, how how long was that? What what is thing to you? I, I mean, I I I, I took a ten minute break and then I came back and played because there was still like an hour left or something. And I played, I I didn't win back. I I kind of like lost the same amount by the time the game ended. Uh, but I knew I still had a, another tournament to play, the main event to play, mm -hmm. the next day. So I had to go sleep. I told all my friends and some people who took action that um, we've lost, but in a manner where I. <laughs> I I did I couldn't do anything and then the next day I came to play the main I was quite focused I really wanna at least make the money uh, in that event and yeah and luckily I did and, and luck, lucky enough to to win that one. The the amount of money that you lost probably like equal to twenty days of playing tournament or something like that in the single hand. But I think this is the the the, the thing that fascinates me about poker pro and yourself as well. Like how do you maintain your uh, compose? Despite the big loss and still perform, I, I think it's all relative, right? Because like, firstly, I, like I said, I don't want to go too, into too much details, but I have ways of managing my bankroll where I'm not overly exposed. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that being said, it was still a lot of money for me. Like, I still had a decent piece for myself in in that game. But uh, it's more like I try to make the right decision in all the games I play in, and if I make the right decision, but it doesn't turn out well, then there's nothing I can do, right? It's like the card slip up, I know I'm gonna lose sometimes, win most of the time, that time I just lost. But yeah, I, I, would, I would admit that I'm still prone to certain levels of tilt. Mm -hmm. I try to negate it by not playing when I'm too tilted or having means of like uh, not making it affect my play. It might affect my mood off the table. I don't tend to show it, but I try to do things or talk to people in ways that I get to feel better soon or I, I, I don't get to like delve too much about it. I know like it's just a hand of poker that I lost. Um, there's still new hands to play every day. Just take it a hand, one hand at a time, and 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 try to do better. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of the mindset. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a good lesson as well. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So basically, you can you can uh, face such a downturn because because there are bigger pictures than on the table. Mm. Uh, managing the bankroll, basically, yeah. you 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 know that you can actually you know like went to the unfortunate period and face this yeah. hand for maybe ten times, yeah. and you still can 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 process it in in a composed way. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a guideline for beginners, say you you play a certain stake, you slowly move up. If you have a bad round, say for example, we have really bad beat for like what you said, ten hands mm -hmm. in. A, short time frame and maybe you lose a certain amount of that bankroll and it's a time where you either drop down stakes or you play the same stakes but you take it slower then maybe you sell more action because uh, it's about maintaining the bankroll you don't want everyone to go bust right and I think I was willing to do that when I was new to high stakes a lot of people when they move up stakes one of the biggest mistakes I see is people are becoming too egotistical to want to play smaller now because mm -hmm. they're used to playing bigger, and that could be a recipe to, to disaster, pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dealing with ego is also one of the. Yeah, because like normally, like when you go to like a winning period, everything is all roses, right? Like you're happy. Sometimes you don't even look like look at the mistake you might have made, things like that. Like I said, like it's sometimes important when you're going through like a losing period to analyze the way you play, or even if you're not doing much wrong, there are always things you can improve in poker. Even studying your opponents or like controlling your mindset or even eliminating tilt is an improvement. Po people, okay, I want to kind of say this as well. Like, people normally misconceive poker as one main innate skill. Like you're born and you're good at cards. There are like uh, what I call card sense where some people understand card games faster than others or in a more strategical way, right? But poker is not the same as for example football or tennis where like that's its own skill. Being good at tennis is a skill, right? Poker is a combination of different skill sets from understanding the underlying principle, from statistical, like you would know, like statistics is an important part. Memorization is very important, understanding ranges or like previous encounters with your opponents. Like if you remember that tendencies, you have, you have an advantage, right? It's about tilt control, um, mindset control, even perspectives in terms of like playing hands. Like sometimes you might study a lot, like the 
theory says you should do this, but you're not open-minded enough to see if your opponent is playing like this, maybe it's better to do it another way. For example, if the server says you should bluff this hand 100% of the time, but you're playing against someone tilted who's not folding bottom pair, then you just shouldn't bluff. This is a very extreme example, something like that. Poker is also, like I said, about like um, lowering ego, managing bankroll. It's about um, picking up meta game dynamics in terms of like how you should adjust to certain games. There's a lot of different factors which I like, blends into one to make like a very good poker player. That's why it's very common to see three, four best poker players in the world having different kind of strongest points. It's not like everyone is good in a similar way. Sometimes they're good in different ways. Just because poker is such a complex game and very interesting kind of like sport where it requires yeah various different kind of like abilities I mean, mm -hmm. to become very good. How do you deal with your ego? <laughs> I guess I just admit that I uh, am pretty lucky compared to the average person. So I think me realizing that doesn't give me a lot of ego. Of course, I do think I do certain things pretty well. And I have very good people who supported me emotionally or strategically. And I have people who supported me when I go through, like, for example, downswings. I have people ensuring I approach my bankroll management in the right way, like giving me good advice. I have people helping me with different facets of my game, but that, I don't know, deep stack heads up, uh, um, ICM, this and that. Like, I have people who are, I, are willing to uh, give me good advice. And a lot of these are, I'm lucky to have friends from since my Bristol days that are now very good poker players and giving me the right advice. And I take the strongest points of each person and sometimes use them to combine and use that as a way of improving myself. But yeah, like I think the way I improve myself a lot and probably be probably doesn't give me that much ego is because I always surround people with people who are better than me. I think. Mm. Yeah. It's it's good to to hear that you. You have some help. Yep. You listen to advice yep. from people. So what are some of the advice that stick to you mentally? <laughs> okay, so besides the strategic advice, because that's uh, complicated, right? So I think poker players are still like, in my opinion, sports people. So being mentored mentally in the right way is good. Like I want to give credit to like my dad, for example. Like, he watches a lot of my streams and uh, when I have like a loss or when I, he tends to give me advice on how I should be happy that I'm part of this uh, fun journey, that I'm lucky enough to be playing poker uh, in these environments against these players. And it's actually really nice, you know, and fulfilling because I, instead of being sad about losing or busting a tournament, you tend to be aware how fortunate you are to be able to play high stakes poker, which to a normal person is a lot of money to, to buy in at a location like, for example, Cyprus or the Bahamas or whatever, where if I'm not playing poker, I, I might not even ever be there, things like that. And by being grateful of a lot of these things in life, it makes um, you happier when you do your job. So when you go through, for example, like downswings or experiencing losses, it's easier to get back on track and play again or improve instead of being sulking like, why am I so unlucky, this and that, because you're already very lucky to be playing in the first place. And yeah, so I would like to thank my dad and a lot of my close friends for that. Like, and yeah, of course my family for allowing me to to take on this journey. If they, if they are like some concerns or if they don't give me like the full freedom, maybe I don't feel so blessed to be to be playing. You know, maybe I have some worries, but no, I don't have any worries about me, me playing. Yeah. It's good to hear that though. I mean, your answer actually portray the whole thing in a bigger picture. Mm. It's, it's like, okay, even in a very bad, bad situation, in a very, very bad, bad bit, but then there are some times that you look at the whole thing in a life perspective. Like even even I get this terrible beat, but I'm fortunate to get to play this rather than doing something that you don't like at all. Yeah, like I, I mean, I I remember, okay. So talking about the hand you said the the aces against Dan Cates, for example, I remember like. But after ten minutes, like I realized, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky enough to be playing poker for this source of money, which is a lot of money for the average person mm. in the middle of a pristine island mm. where many of the best films are filmed at, and like you you. I probably, if I'm actually unlucky, I wouldn't be here, you know? So, uh, yeah, things like this m make you uh, recover from beats faster, I think. And mm -hmm. just like being grateful for life in general and, and having the right people to encourage you in the in the right way, but not like always just to make you feel good. Obviously, when you do something bad or stuff, they, they tell you. But to be able to have people who remind you of these kind of things is always very helpful, whether that's focal or other, or other aspects of life. Everyone's going to have problems in life, right? Mm -hmm. It's how you 
um, encounter them is how you uh, see your other um, fortunate uh, sides or, or, or things in your life that are occurring at the same time as these problems that make you um, in a better uh, state of mind, I think. Mm. At this episode, we, we talk a lot about poker, but of course there are audience that who doesn't yeah, sure. in their life never touch a ship before. But there was also, there was actually a very good answer to, to many people questions like sometimes when they are stuck to their, they feel like they are unlucky, they are unfortunate, they're stuck in a bad day, bad beats in our term, but they forgot to appreciate the big pictures that, okay, we, we get to work at the job that we be doing. doing yeah, in yeah. very nice locations, you know. Uh, speaking of poker, now, now I'm going to touch more about the country's economy, basically legalized poker or gambling, because right now they have a big conversation about legalized poker or gambling in Thailand. What's your thought about it? Okay, so I want to answer this in the context of just poker legalization because that's kind of my area of focus, right? So I think from experience and from seeing models of other countries, I think poker should be legalized yes, in, in Thailand. And that's not from just a personal um, standpoint, but due to different reasons. Firstly, it's universally accepted as a competitive sport, brain sport, I think. Because in a lot of countries, especially in Asia, some countries like Taipei or even Japan, uh, or Vietnam, for example, uh, casinos are illegal, mm -hmm. but poker are legal. Like poker tournaments are legal, and if in these countries uh, it is legal, then there's no reason why it shouldn't be legal in Thailand. I think there's also courses at universities in the states that teaches poker as one of their courses. If it's full term gambling, it couldn't be one of the subjects I think being taught at those, at those universities. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think it does bring vast benefits to the country mm -hmm. in terms of the economy economy like you said not just in terms of foreign foreign direct investment or like spending on like tourism or hotels or, or even our restaurants and stuff supporting local um, businesses and stuff but even the creation of jobs I think there may be a lot of Thai people who can become a dealer or more so uh, become like for example card room managers or someone who runs the floor like you know in these poker tournaments there's people who are like a floor man some like directors and stuff. There's different roles, you know, at the total tournament. It's not just dealers. There's also like those doing accounting in the cashiers um, at APTs for, for all other series. There's in big, big events that it requires a lot of like um, man work, you know, and I think the creation of jobs is one of the most beneficial things that comes with um, hosting poker tournaments. Mm -hmm. I also think it would give aspirers or young people who enjoy the game more of a freedom to express their love for the game. For example, these days people enjoy playing golf, people enjoy uh, going abroad, doing hiking, this and that, but I, I feel like the younger generation who like poker, who even if they want to play poker for fun, but challenge themselves like occasionally at these like legalized tournaments, they, they're not like overly happy to state that because maybe they feel people who doesn't really know poker in Thailand perceive it as gambling due to the fact that it's still prohibited from um, legalize, from the legalization aspect. So legalizing, legalizing it would maybe change the perspectives of a lot of people and allow these uh, young people to be more expressive that they are enjoying the sport, that they want to compete and stuff. And yeah, I think there's many knock-on effects in my opinion. Thank you very much. There was one small thing it's a gimmick for this program is that I want the guests to ask any question to me because for the last two hours it's me asking you that, oh. that is there anything that come up to your mind okay so so I think like um the fact that you also um, is a poker enthusiast where some of your free time besides other stuff you spend exploring these um, poker venues abroad and stuff what's your experience like for this uh, couple of years which you have been playing abroad do you really enjoy it how do you how do you how would you explain your experience in general? I, I, I love poker maybe because it's such a contradict experience comparing to my, my personal life. For example, you know, like in poker, you can actually be aggressive. But when you are being aggressive in poker, it's like playing with chips. So it's under the rules. And sometimes you should be aggressive. But in, in my work, sometimes I have to hide that I cannot be as aggressive. You know, like when I, when I talk to my people, when I talk to a business partner, I have to sort of uh, hide that, that aspect of me. Uh, that's, that's from personal take. But in terms of tourism experience, it's, it's a good atmosphere to, to gather people who are like actively you know, engaged in, in the activity that they love. I, I, I 
from you know I've been to five or six venues. Taipei is my favorite. I feel like the people there are nice. Uh, you enjoy the vibe. At the same time, when you when you are outside, you can you can go eat nice food, and the weather is nice. So and I feel like Bangkok and Thailand can can be times better than that. So that that's my my experience towards it. There was also another thing I wanted to mention, like um, in a lot of sports in other maybe more established countries, there's maybe a lot of competitiveness between the players from their own country. But I don't know if you have the same um, sense as me. But I think in Thailand, there's a lot of camaraderie in terms of like everyone supporting each other. It's a very warm community, and when you go abroad, regardless if you're like a beginner. Uh, uh, a mid-stakes pro or one who play high stakes, everyone seems to know each other and support each other, right? Yes. Uh, in in both ways. Um, do, do you agree with me that you get this? Yeah. yeah. Like Thailand is very strong in terms of this like spirit or like su- supportiveness between, among the the players. Yeah, I think there's a charming about Thai-ness. Similarly, when when you are uh, tourists and you go to abroad, you you get to hear someone you know like speaking Thai, and, and whenever you feel like homesick, you just go to a Thai restaurant and you feel you feel welcome. So I, I like that aspect of on the table. So it's, it's strange sometimes because your your best part. The next thing you know, you sitting on the right of you, and then you feel like okay, what should I do to should be aggressive to that? But that's the best thing you know, right? And it's it, I, I hope it's continued this way, because in in many countries the the vibe are totally different. I think you you know much. More. Yeah, yeah. So 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 your first point was like um, if you are with a friend on the same table, right? So um. There shouldn't be any soft playing. You should play your best against your friend, and both sides should understand that this is a sport. Like the first time you play football with your friend, right? Mm-hmm. And afterwards, you can like even discuss the hands you played, and and like uh, there's no harsh feelings in beating each other up. It's a sport, right? You need to do your best. And uh, like for me personally, like the tightness you said is whenever I play on like a, a stream game, a stream tournament, final table. Of course, the chat is like so much, so many times about supporting. But even in these live venues, like at Taipei, for example, when you were there, I guess so much support, which I felt is very nice, you know, like when I started playing tournaments, I wasn't playing in front of a Thai audience. Mm-hmm. That's why I kept going to these like uh, more Asian tournament series where there's a lot more Thai people going because it felt like I get to connect with the other, my other colleagues, for example. And in return, like if there's someone who's running deep, I always encourage everyone to come and support them. I think it's very nice to have these two way kind of communication in a way. and. Mm-hmm. It's just a fun experience in general, right? Like you, you, you feel like you're part of that like, team, and and like you could help people get like help each other become better, this and that. Mm. I I hope that by the time it gets to like next year, we are gonna get to educate more people. Sure. Yeah. I hope poker become legalized, and we just gonna because I agree with you, uh, the skill that you adopt from poker table, you can actually apply to your life. So I feel I feel like I hope next year it's gonna be. A lot broader. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you, Captain Punat. Uh, no problem. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Captain.